Hello. <laughs> My name is Vladik Filler. For those who don't know me, still, after that introduction, uh, I'm a father of two uh, who has uh, fought false allegations and prosecutorial misconduct for over 10 years in Maine. My case set some new precedents and uh, is the subject of an important federal civil rights lawsuit currently. Um, I'm honored to have been invited to speak at NCFM's 40th anniversary celebration. Uh, I'm also honored to finally meet Harry Crouch, who I'm proud to call my friend. For years, NCFM has followed and supported my fight. NCFM is the only organization, men's organization that I know of, that takes legal actions against discrimination and unjust treatment of men. Anyone who takes the fight to a courtroom does so at great risk and expense, but fights directly for human dignity and human rights where the outcome can create real, tangible change. So I'm here to thank NCFM and Harry Crouch for what he and this organization is doing for men and boys and to share some of my experiences and observations with the hope they may help others. Thousands of years ago, in the pre-Christian Celtic mythology, there was a goddess queen of battle who delivered a prophecy about the end of the world that would come during an evil time when in the future, virtue will be lost. She prophesied that in the coming age, women will be shameless and men will be strengthless. Old men will give false judgments, and lawyers will pass unjust laws. An evil time in the world. Those who have experienced false allegations, court battles, false convictions, that prophesized time rings true now. That's what we have, an epidemic of absolutely shameless women lying about their intimate relationships with their husbands, their boyfriends, and fathers of their children. Nothing seems sacred to these women. We also have absolutely weak men who kowtow to institutionalized injustice that is crippling our society. Just look at the m kind of men our society is currently producing weak. When people say women don't lie about rape, I ask, since when? Some women lie about rape and abuse like it's nothing. There, has been, there have been numerous cases where women beat themselves up, penetrate themselves with objects rip their own hair out of their head in order to seem more believable when falsely accusing men of raping them. There are women who lie about having cancer. There are women who splash acid on their own faces, causing permanent scars just so to play victim and accuse someone of attacking them. How many innocent men have suffered in prison or were attacked and beaten to death based on lies about rape. Most Innocence Project exonerees, as you may know, were falsely convicted of rape. Many women lie. Of course, not all women, <laughs> but many do lie. There are some women who go through life lying and conning their way into people's hearts and lives, and who manipulate men on the level many men simply are too blind to understand. 
And it often works because everyone naturally wants to believe women and protect them from harm. Some people call that gynocentrism, whatever. Think of the Salem witch trials, where all accusers were young females who accused some 200 people, many for personal vindictive reasons of witchcraft, which caused 20 innocent souls to be executed, and many more to languish in prison for almost a year before the witch trials were over. Women's lives are dangerous, especially in the hands of authoritarian zealots. Many women feeling angry and resentful towards men for whatever reason seem to easily rationalize shameless lying and ruthless, selfish indifference to their victims in order to get their way or just to get revenge on men for whatever perceived wrong. False allegations during divorce and custody battles are standard operating procedure for many women. But we expect police and prosecutors to know better and to act accordingly when accusations are made during divorces and child custody disputes. Women's ability to lie is not a secret, as most people with common sense know this. Consider, for instance, that studies show that between 2 and 10% of men have been fooled by women into raising children that are biologically not their own. One study showed that 30% of men paying child support are paying for children that are not theirs. The idea that women don't lie about rape, rape or domestic violence is absolutely absurd. Maybe it's something evolutionary or a survival skill or perhaps a type of a mental illness, but it has been common knowledge through all of human history that women can be very deceptive and lie on the scale and to a degree which men do not, and to a degree many men simply can't believe until they become victims of outrageous lies. Are such facts misogynistic? If anyone's offended by, uh, by what I'm saying, I'm only speaking for myself here and no one else. We laugh when we hear comedians like Chris Rock and, and maybe Bill Burr make politically incorrect jokes about women's dishonesty, not because they're offensive jokes, but because they're true. While we can laugh at such jokes, we're never allowed to publicly di discuss this with seriousness without being censored and attacked by s PC thought police. But we must be able to speak openly and honestly and not be intimidated into silence. Many women have and do lie about rape. Many women lie about abuse. Many women lie about paternity. Shameless women's lies ruin lives. And yet, despite all this, what an amazing feat has been performed by feminist organizations who have trained the public and police with such slogans as, believe her. What is that slogan, believe her, really saying? If the police and prosecutors and jurors are taught to believe her, then they are also being taught to presume man's guilt. If police and courts and uh, legislators are being trained by feminist advocacy groups to just believe every female that calls the police, then you're also training the, the public to believe that all accused men are guilty and should be treated and punished as guilty the minute they are accused by any female. 
The legal process has been politi uh, politicized, undermined, and hijacked by subversive special interest groups from outside and inside the justice system. If that was not enough, what is taking place in many courts is men being deprived of the most basic due process rights to present evidence or even have access to exculpatory evidence. My divorce and custody battle lasted four years and I was criminally prosecuted for eight years from 2007 to 2015 when I was finally fully exonerated of the last of the false claims made by my ex-wife during our child custody dispute. What was my crime? I tried to leave an abusive relationship and relocate with my two sons. It was my crime that I loved my sons? It was their crime that they loved me, wanted to be with me? I also refused to submit to legal abuse. As a result, my family and I were put through a surreal Kafkaesque court nightmare where I faced the possible loss of my children to the state and the loss of my freedom for up to 152 years because of lies and malicious prosecutorial misconduct. I tried to have a civilized separation from my wife, but instead I found myself fighting the entire legal system for my life and for my children's lives on numerous legal fronts all at the same time. Simultaneously, I fought the state prosecutors trumped up felony charges, the Child Protective Services child protection charges, my wife and her two attorneys in the divorce and custody battle, including a pro bono attorney provided to her by a local feminist advocacy organization. I fought three protection from abuse complaints, which my ex-wife filed against me for the children in two separate counties, cooperated with two guardian ad litems, struggled to pay my legal bills, and, and for periods of time was forced to represent myself and my children pro se because we were broke. All this, and I endured a multi-count criminal jury trial for class A felony spousal sexual assault and assault, a false conviction, a trial court's reversal, the prosecutor's appeal, a divorce hearing right in the middle of the criminal appeal, a divorce appeal, a multi-count criminal retrial, and a second criminal appeal for a sole misdemeanor uh, assault conviction, false imprisonment, a Board of Overseers action that I initiated uh, b against the prosecutor, a post-conviction review where the absurd misdemeanor charge for which I was jailed was reversed and dismissed after e eight years of legal battles. I've had to deal with 20 different judges from district court to superior court to state supreme court, federal court, first circuit court of appeals, 20 judges. To quote Johnny Cash, it certainly feels like I've been everywhere. But I'm still here, I still have my children, I'm still fighting for justice via federal civil rights lawsuit. My bar complaint against the prosecutor, which I wrote during one of the darkest periods of my life, took me three months to write and almost three years to fight. Against all odds, it resulted in the first prosecutor in Maine's history to be disciplined for prosecutorial misconduct and civil rights violations against me. For the past two and a half years, my attorneys Tim Zorillo, Tom Hallett, and David Warens and I have pursued a federal civil rights lawsuit against 18 parties, including four prosecutors, numerous law enforcement officers, and various parties involved in the case which has consumed over 10 years of my life. 
I mention my attorneys by name because these men are heroes for taking such an important and difficult case. I also would like to mention uh, Jam Jamesa Drake, who is an attorney for ACLU, who presented oral arguments and, and uh, presented a brief on behalf of ACLU at, to the First Circuit Court in the case. We don't have the time for me to get into all the details of my case. For those interested in prosecutorial misconduct, absolute versus qualified immunity, civil rights violations, I recommend searching online and finding uh, federal, my federal civil rights lawsuit and recent f uh, federal court and first circuit court rulings in Vladek Filler versus Hancock County. I cannot have overstate how rare and difficult it is to overcome numerous legal barriers so prosecutors would face a court of law or a jury for their misconduct. My civil rights, uh, rights lawsuit is moving forward to trial and it might help shed light on misconduct of a district attorney's office which prosecuted many other men. There's nothing easy about what I have been forced to endure or what my attorneys and I are, I are undertaking now. And I cannot possibly detail now what I went through, but what is important is what my experience can do to help others fight against all odds in situations where few ever prevail and where the odds are compounded against you each step of the way. When a man is falsely accused of a crime, he is, first off, is at the mercy of prosecutors who decide whether to pursue charges against him or not. Prosecutors are the gatekeepers with wide open discretion which they can easily abuse based on their own ideological or personal biases. Prosecutors are supposed to seek justice and truth, not merely a conviction, and are supposed to bring forth criminal charges where there's a reasonable likelihood that they can get a conviction. But if the prosecutor has her own agenda or perhaps psychological issues, she can simply abuse her discretion, hide evidence, and present falsified evidence in order to justify prosecuting men on nothing more than accusation, no, no matter how absurd or blatantly false those accusations may be. Some prosecutors deliberately engage in misconduct only because they think they can get away with it, because the chances that they, are, they will be held accountable by their peers or their victims is relatively low. Prosecutors rarely get sanctioned or have their licenses suspended by ethics boards or face criminal charges for their misconduct. In my case, the prosecutor became the first in Maine's history to be disciplined by the Board of Overseers for prosecutorial misconduct. It was discipline in name only, but even that was the first ever in Maine's history after this particular prosecutor handled some 10,000 cases in a relatively small community where a lot of innocent men were being prosecuted. The U.S. State's Attorney's Office from the Federal Justice Department, the U.S. State's Attorney General's Office, and the State Attorney Generals virtually never bring civil rights or other criminal charges against prosecutors who deliberately withhold, destroy, fabricate evidence against innocent people. So the last option is a private civil rights lawsuit. But it is hard to sue prosecutors because they generally have immunity f from civil lawsuits for what they do in the course of prosecu their prosecutorial function. In other words, anything that they can, they do during the course of a judicial process that is part of their prosecutorial function, they have absolute immunity. But prosecutors too often engage in misconduct as if they have absolute immun immunity for everything they do, which is not true. But in the real world, they, are rarely, they rarely face consequences because it's so difficult to hold them accountable. Usually in the real world, prosecutors may face some minor sanctions or a trial judge for misconduct, but from what I've seen, such sanctions are minor and not very common and, and not very effective in stopping the prosecutors who misbehave. What we have today is an all-powerful state 
that is run by effectively immune actors. With the power to take even our children and parental rights away, arrest us, prosecute the parents, e use fake evidence, fabricated evidence, all with impunity. Is that what the Founding Fathers really had in mind? Because that's what we got today. America has become a nation where American people have very little say. In the if the state, for example, can bring and force settlement of millions of foreigners, some with criminal records, into our communities, despite laws and overwhelming objections from Americans, does, the, does democracy exist? Who's in control of the courts? Not us. Who's in control of our government? Not us. Who's in control of policy decisions being made that devastate our lives? Not us. If there's one thing that we do have control over is how we choose to respond to disenfranchisement and abuse and, the, and oppression that is foisted upon us and our families and our communities. Americans are losing their right even to their children and families and, and to this country. At what point do people say that's enough? At what point do people start fighting with everything they got, like their ancestors did? <laughs> it is difficult for me to understand fathers who don't fight for their children and falsely accuse men who don't fight to reform the system where prosecutors are allowed to commit crimes with impunity. If we don't fight for our children against civil rights abuse, then what chance does America have to survive in light of all these other challenges it's facing? The men who fought for America's independence and for a Bill of Rights were no pushovers. When they signed the Declaration of Independence, they signed their own death warrants and they did it anyway. Wh where are such men now? We desperately need them now. It's not enough to be a born again hero only while you're facing court losses and a divorce or facing prison. Every man who has survived false allegations has a duty to do something at the very least, speak out and not just go on with your life and leave it to someone else to, to fight for change. But nothing I can say here today will do justice to illustrate the degree of suffering and injustice that is being caused and the urgency of the situation in the judicial branch, which is by far the most powerful branch of our government because it interprets and applies laws that are used to either violate or protect our civil rights. And the judicial branch is the only one that really doesn't really answer directly to the people. <coughs> what false allegations do in the real world to the victims of such lies is often completely destroy someone's life and the life of their loved ones, financially ruin them, put them through the trauma of a criminal trial or two criminal trials, as was in, in my case, <laughs> takes away their freedom, throws them into prison, sometimes for decades, psychologically and physically assaults and traumatizes them for the rest of their life and puts them on registries or restrictions for those who were convicted. The victims often end up developing very serious health problems. Lose weight, lose hair, lose teeth from the stress, not being able to sleep, living with permanent trauma and post-traumatic stress disorder. Those are just some of the results of criminal prosecutions where due process and basic constitutional rights and human rights of the falsely accused men are ignored. 
and it's getting easier and easier to complete to for completely innocent men to be accused and convicted, especially since so many people sitting on the juries have been brainwashed by radical anti-male theories and fake statistics. Once accused, men are often deprived of their ability to defend themselves in court, to present evidence that they need to. Keep in mind the presentation that Karen just gave. to properly cross-examine their accuser, to present witnesses, and they're prevented from even being able to testify about their own side of the story in some cases. The scales of justice have been tipped against accused men all along the way, and the, trial, the trials often seem to be nothing more than very formal and polite lynchings with only a facade of due process. Due process is also something denied in pretrial rulings, at sidebar evidentiary rulings, and in chamber decisions by judges, where few realize what kind of exculpatory evidence gets barred from the eyes and ears of the jury and the public. The juries can easily be lied to, manipulated with fear, and kept in the dark, easily. The falsely accused men and their defense attorneys can be subjected to very biased evidentiary rulings and sustained objections made by prosecutors who may approach prosecution like a cat and mouse game rather than a search for truth or justice. I've seen, I've never seen a defense attorney get anything, any of those so-called mythological technical um, on, on technological, uh, mythological uh, technicalities, where they get their client off on a little technicality. I've never seen that. You often see on, tel uh, on TV shows and the movies them lamenting that some bad man or a bad criminal got off on a technicality. I've not seen anything like that. What I have seen, however, is prosecutors get away with some outrageous misconduct and allow some outrageous sus sustained objections to vital evidence, even evidence such as police interview transcripts and police reports, which prosecutors themselves used in discovery. In other words, the prosecutor is using something they object to keeping it out, and it's kept out. In my opinion, those who survive these modern day witch trials and lynchings are the exceptions to the rule. The ridiculous notion that rape convictions without any evidence beyond an accusation are hard to obtain is an absurd claim in my opinion. I believe that as long as the accusers are coached and come to the stand to squeeze out a few tears, as long as biased special interest groups are directly and indirectly allowed to corrupt the, the legal process against men, and as long as the prosecutors are allowed to engage in misconduct, the juries will act out of fear and emotions and will convict mostly, most of the accused men based on even the most absurd accusations imaginable. Remember in 1692 in Salem, 20 decent people brutally executed based on specter evidence. Does anybody know what specter evidence is? Meaning, that the accused people, the accusers were claiming that the accused were sending their spirit at them and tormenting them with their spirit, okay? Their spirit. We're back in Salem now, in courtrooms all across the country. What is being used to convict men seems more like specter evidence than actual evidence where the accuser's feelings and emotions are the only basis for evidence needed to find someone guilty of alleged violent crimes. Due process and presumption of innocence, those are just words. In the real world, if you're accused, and if the prosecutor decides to push ahead with the case at all costs by any unethical means, when every, then every accused man entering the courtroom 
is at a disadvantage and carries the burden of proving his innocence, which is often insurmountable burden by the way such cases are administered. The prosecutors are often out of control, and for the most part, they're completely immune. And even while faced with blatant disregard for the rule of law and civil, uh, and, and, and civil rights by prosecutors, the falsely accused men, they believe in hope and pray that they can still somehow rely on, that, on the same system to be fair during trial that these same prosecutors will somehow have to play by the rules eventually, and then these men are, con men are convicted. And the process is repeated as they again hope and pray and think that surely the appeals court will review this outrageous misconduct by the prosecutors or the trial court and put an end to this. And again, that is just not the reality that I'm familiar with. In fact, a huge burden is placed effectively on the defendants each step of the way, from accusation to indictment to pretrial to trial to appeal, until the burden on the defendant becomes so great, greater and greater to the point that it's virtually and practically insurmountable. This process traumatize, traumatizes and destroys many falsely accused men, both emotionally and psychologically, even if they're acquitted. Therefore, malicious prosecutions of men are used by some prosecutors to torture and punish these men, regardless of whether the conviction can even be obtained against them. In other words, the process is being used to abuse these men, regardless of whether the evidence shows that conviction is even possible. I follow many cases, and I have also talked to some men in these situations and their families, and they often ask me for help. I know of cases where men who are completely innocent have been, have been in prison for decades, and the prosecutors ref refuse to admit or correct what was done to them, even after the accusers come forward and detail how they were threatened by the authorities to go along with the false claims. I know men who have been sent to prison as a result of the kind of misconduct I just described. Outside of the, cor the courts of law, there's also an open assault and presumption of innocence and due process in the court of public opinion. And these outrageous notions, believe her, one in five women, only 2% of rape claims are false. These have an effect on the administration of criminal justice and the jury's perception of reality. And the accused, their life is hell. Months, years, decades of hell. They can't live, they can't plan, they can't do anything. Their life is on the shelf, along with all the case files which can be, I can tell you, quite large. They are burdened with the insanity of lies, fabrications, and too often with prosecutorial misconduct and prosecutors' indifference to truth and evidence. The accused suffer, they hurt, they lose their mind and their health, and are forced to live with severe trauma long after the so-called resolutions to their cases. I'm not against prosecutors or the police or judges. On the contrary, I support ethical and honorable public servants who work very hard. In the case of the police, they literally put their lives on the line to protect all of us. What I am against is people who get drunk on power and immunity. People who get into positions of power, then engage in compulsions to hurt people and rationalize their abuse as somehow being for a greater good. There are dirty prosecutors that fully believe that they are the good guys as they openly commit crimes against people. We can't even imagine what prosecutors could accomplish if they actually sought to protect our constitutional rights 
rather than use the law like a club to beat people over the head with. We had the biggest criminals given a free pass as being too big to jail. While regular people and their families with no resources to fight are being destroyed for nothing more than accusations and in the name of radical social ideologies. It's devastating beyond, devastating beyond overwhelming when the state prosecutors involve themselves and take sides in private disputes such as divorces and child custody battles. Many people have asked me how to fight and what to do if they're falsely accused or facing a nightmarish criminal or divorce court battle. Here are my 10 suggestions. But really, these are just common sense things that are all intertwined. Number one, self-control. Wrong decisions. <coughs> wrong decisions are the easiest to make when you're under stress. A man cannot think and act strategically. And that and is at his weakest when he's unable to assert self-control and keep a cool head during crisis situations. No matter how bad and how unjust the situation, the only way to minimize losses and maximize gains is through self-control. Never lose self-control when dealing with courts, lawyers, guardian with items, therapists, anyone or anyone else for that matter. Number two, credibility. Do not engage in frivolous actions, whether it's with the courts or police or CPS. This is not a game. Credibility and measured conduct is key, regardless of how corrupt or unjust the system is or how other involved parties conduct themselves. Always hold yourself to the highest standards. Your credibility is everything. Number three, strength, courage, and will. Know the difference between strength and weakness in the real world. The stereotypical alpha males may come to mind when we think of strength and courage. In reality, the legal system can drive alpha types to self-destruct. Many suicides during custody battles, divorces, and false allegations are committed by alpha type males. Some who have survived the horrors of wars but cannot survive the horrors of our court systems. The point is, to be strong and courageous may not be what many might think. Sometimes letting go of your pride and your ego and doing everything you must to see your children and to save your children is strength and courage. Never giving up fighting for what matters most is strength and courage. Number four, don't initiate legal actions or go into a courtroom without an attorney. In my experience, it is very difficult to prevail pro se. Never be foolish enough to think that you're Perry Mason or that the court will somehow show you understanding and compassion. A pro se litigant risks his rights, his freedom, and the safety of his children by making a colossal mistake to take any action without an attorney next to him. There are exceptions, but the general rule of thumb is not to show up in court without a lawyer. Judges don't want to deal with you. You're a liability to deal with for in a court. You're too involved. They can't trust everything you say. They'd rather deal with a lawyer, no matter how skillful you are or how detailed. 
You can help your lawyer, just don't show up to court without a lawyer. To lose, number five, to lose is to stop fighting. Remember that you never lose as long as you keep fighting. You only lose when you stop fighting and accept defeat. Fighting is the only thing that changes anything, and losing is part of the process of winning. I, could not, I would not be here, and my children would not be with me if I didn't overcome many, many losses and kept fighting anyway. Number six, time can be your ally. Time can be on your side if you learn to accept your fight and make time your friend. You, you only lose when you stop fighting. If you don't like to lose, then fight on and you'll never lose. Number seven, determination and persistence. Fighting for injustice is not a sprint. It's fighting injustice is not a sprint, it's a marathon. Be relentless. It's okay to be mad. It's not okay to let it build up inside you and do nothing about it. There's only one type of power, and that is the power of the will. Turn your pain, your anger, and your frustration into a strong will and fight on. Number eight. This one's where a lot of people are gonna get angry with me. Drinking alcohol or any substance abuse dulls your mind, weakens your body, and can undermine your effectiveness. Engage in activities and habits that strengthen you. Work out your frustrations and anxieties by physically strengthening yourselves and your body and sharpening your mind in the process. Number nine, be effective. This is the most important one, maybe. Be effective. The key is effectiveness. Because that is all that matters when fighting for your children, your freedom, or your life. To be effective means that everything you do, every action that you take should be helpful towards your goal. Self-control, measured actions, be effective. Number 10. Learn the tools and create new ones as needed in order to help you be more effective. Do your homework. Read cases and decisions. Read Sun Tzu's The Art of War. It may not be helpful, but it'll, it's therapeutic. And it might help you learn to think Okay. So read the art of war. It, it may not be directly helpful to your situation, but it, it will at least help you think more strategically. Um, if you want to re win in the real world, you need to try to understand the real world better than your opponents. And sometimes, if you're willing to fight to win, you can make a difference. You can save your children and maybe even leave a better world in the process. So those are my few basic suggestions. In conclusion, not sure if I laid out the case, but regardless, we're in the middle of a cultural revolution against Americans against American culture and against the constitution, constitutional rule of law. In this environment, if anyone wants to know just how powerful and vital prosecutors are, then look no further than George Soros, 
who's funding district attorney races all over America right now in order to install gatekeepers to criminal charges who agree with his ideology in deciding who to charge and prosecute and who not to, who not to prosecute and charge. What will this mean? Will certain identity groups of people not get criminally charged, but others will? Just, just based on George Soros' position, for example. May not be relevant here, but in regards to illegal immigration, will illegal immigrants get a complete pass and Americans will be prosecuted for not accommodating them? Our system of justice has been turned against us. More and more, to abuse and beat us down more and more. That's what the trend, what the trend is. And at the center of it are prosecutors. Installed by political means and control who gets targeted and punished and who gets a free pass for their crimes. Again, due process and presumption of innocence, are, those are just words. Words, the true meaning of which we must fight to define and enforce. Key word there is fight. There's no other choice. The founding fathers warned that Americans would have to fight to protect their rights because they will be systemically eroded. Many people believe that the U.S. Constitution is there to protect us, but it can't protect us if we neglect to protect it. And it seems we fail to miserably to protect it, fail to fight for it, fail to support all the organizations and very brave attorneys who burn out fighting to protect it. I want to end with this little story. I was not born here. I'm an Eastern European Slav who came here at the age of 10. For most of my life, I've lived in Boston, where architectural relics and ghosts of America's history are still there to speak to those who will listen and take notice of what this nation and its people stood for and fought for. In Boston Harbor, there's a very special ship called the USS Constitution, which is the world's oldest still commissioned naval ship and one of the original six Navy frigates. It was commissioned and named the Constitution by George Washington himself. And it was built using, in Boston, using very strong southern oak from Georgia and copper and brass fittings supplied by Paul Revere. You know that Paul Revere? It took on and won against the mightiest navy in the world, defeating five British warships, and earned itself the name of Ironside in the process, in the battle against Guerrier. Some 200 years ago, a ragtag army and later, later navy of your forefathers told the British, we don't care how strong you think you are, we'll fight you. We'll fight you on land, and we'll take these here oak logs, and we'll build a navy. And then we'll fight you on the seas as well. Because we don't care about your corrupt class society of untouchable elites. You won't tread on us. Every American should go to the Charleston Navy Yard in Boston and walk on the decks of the USS Constitution and think about that. Old Ironside still stands in Boston Harbor today with all its cannons ready to fight to defend Americans. 
All that it ever needed was to be cherished enough for people to fight to preserve it. And there it is. The only preserved shit like it in the world. And it was aptly named the Constitution because just like this majestic ship, the actual US Constitution document left to Americans by its founding fathers is also still here. Ready to be used to defend the rights and liberties of Americans if people cherish it enough to fight, to defend and reinforce it now as is, as is needed. So this founding document can be strong enough to continue to defend this nation and its children in return. That is what I am fighting for, and I hope others will too. Thank you and God bless.